Hi there, welcome to the second video from my YouTube channel and I'm here in my study slash junk room here in Taiwan which I will let you have a look at just to prove that I do have some books before I begin wittering on about them okay So today I'll just talk about three short novels that you might want to read if you're looking for something nice and fast. Um, okay, so I'll get started. The first one I'll talk about is uh, this one. Rudyard Kipling, uh, Captain's Courageous. And it's a very um, exciting adventure story. Coming of age story about a rich kid who falls off a liner while he's on the last day of a cruise with his family and um, is believed lost at sea but in fact he's been picked up by a fishing boat and he has to complete an Atlantic fishing season before uh, the, the irascible captain will return him to shore and in that time he seriously learns what it takes to transition from a boy to a man in the company of these uh, hard-bitten sailors. Not only is it very exciting, but Kipling's writing is uh, superb, and particularly even the beginning on the cruise liner, the German character, the way his accent is rendered is so, so amusing. And um, Kipling does this as well in some of the stories in the Jungle Book. I think there's one called The Rook, or In the Rook, uh, where there's a Dutch guy who um, speaks the most amusing variation of English, whereas, um, whereas Mowgli, in the same story, speaks like an English aristocrat. He sounds like Byron or something. Um, so that is a very, very funny short book. The, uh, the second one is... I uh, don't usually see this too much on YouTube, I think. Uh, is Christopher Isherwood's Prata Violet. Um, it, it's really short. It's in huge type. It's in huge type. And it's less than 100 pages. But it's one of the funniest, richest short novels I've read. And what it is, is it's... Like, it's autobiographical, but... This is what I like about Christopher Isherwood. He's not at the centre of this story, even though it concerns him directly. And he's got one of his first jobs, and there is always in Isherwood this kind of imposter syndrome. So somehow he's wangled a job on a movie production, and they're bringing over this um, this director called, I'll just tell you his name, Friedrich Bergman. I think he's Austrian, maybe Viennese. And... He is the centre of this short novel, which is an astonishing, astonishing portrait of this, at first, extremely eccentric individual. But as it goes on, and it peels away the layers of, of, of Bergman, it's a little like a, some of the Thomas Bernard novels, you begin to understand why this man behaves, seems to have so many aspects and dimensions to him. He's not some madman, even though he, his behavior appears strange from the outside. He's impossibly human. He's so rich in his feelings and his passion for his art and for other people. And as you begin to understand the peril in which his family are, at the time that he's trying to make this movie and that those feelings are going into the work of art. It's quite a moving book actually and Christopher Ishwood is, I think his finest quality is being able to stand off to the side even when he's writing the sort of autobiogra autobiographical um, novels and just let someone else be the star. Uh, there's another book by him called Down There on a Visit it's kind of three um, short 
maybe they're even like novellas, but it's it centers on three different characters. And the third one, I think it is in there, is about a guy called Bruno. Who, again, when we meet him, he seems this superficial character in some ways, although he's quite exceptional. He's got this reputation as the most expensive male prostitute in the world, so he's got this mystique that he's carrying around. But the interesting thing there is, Bruno, during, I think it's World War II, is in the US, and he, ta he joins the forestry service. And you see what an absolute hero this man is. And the uh, the respect and admiration that he gains from the these uh, quite hard bitter men again, a little like Captain's Courageous, that he's thrown into company with, and you also see Bruno's kind of pitiful death um, from excess, something like the Earl of Rochester or something like this. You know, he's he's condemned to an early death by the excesses of his lifestyle. You see these last days as well, or maybe like an Oscar Wilde figure. And you see, even though the death is pitiful, you see the life that has preceded it as being something quite magnificent. So it puts um, puts Bruno into a, into a perspective. And that, that book is really good too. That's a little bit of a side track there. The last one, I was just looking around on the shelves for one. Anything that would be about the right length, so... Um, there's also this one, H.G. Um, Wells, The Island of Dr. Moreau. I think uh, it's only 128 pages, but it's, it's quite an astonishing story in its, in its scope uh, that's opened up as many of the same kind of themes as Frankenstein, um, actually. But you don't have to go on these walking tour of Europe as you do in Mary Shelley's um, book. You can just follow this um, trip to this island and uh, I, th I think the, uh, the narrator is a kind of itinerant um, wealthy guy who's just bumbling around the world and his, his boat somehow fetches up on this island and then he's pushed into this incredible encounter with the, um, the doings of the mad scientist Dr. Moreau and of course Wells was really involved in the anti-river section movement. So central theme here is about what right we have um, to treat animals um, in the way that we do. Um, the doctor is a hellish figure, but he's also recognizable in that um, he extracts knowledge from pain. So there is this idea that he's, I think he says he's trying to burn out the animal and um, leave something human behind but it's it's impossible to do it's beautifully imagined there's some amazing scenes in the in the night time on the island and it is genuinely uh quite a frightening read as well it still brings up lots of um, issues that people focus on in the animal studies today i'm going to choose one last one i'll go and get it off the shelf i'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. <coughs> choose two actually um, I wasn't going to include these because they're just over 200 pages but I think one definition of a short novel is how easy they are to read and there is such a thing as a fast 200 page novel and there's um, a slow 200 page novel and this one actually is um, G.K. Chesterton I've got a few editions of these but um, I think the other one was a bit bit shorter. Um, the Man Who Was Thursday. The reason that can go in there is even if this was 500 pages long, I think you'd still be reading it in a few hours because genuinely one of the most exciting um, stories, imaginative stories that you could hope to read and beautifully rendered as well. And with so many um, amazing scenes in there make a great movie. I think I've got some movies somewhere. I haven't sat down and watched them, but Viva Vendetta has something of the feel of this. If you haven't, uh, if your sort of literary interest don't go all the way back to Chesterton and the opening sequence where the, uh, the guy falls into the company with the anarchists is really amazing. And, and the way it develops is some, there's a logic there, but it's the logic of a, of a, of a nightmare 
as um, Chesterton describes this um, fiction. It's incredible what it does to London and the way it blooms into this bizarre, like, like paganistic, like Arthurian kind of ending with this sudden explosion of these, um, of colour at the end and almost like it's like a different world that it, that it falls into particularly the the ending but it also contains an amazing chase sequence um which through the streets of london which i, I won't spoil but oh dear that is such an exciting novel it's one where you, actually you probably spoil the literary experience by just reading it too quickly for the the story is just too good and and so strange and chesterton's one of my favorites his other um this other one is, is here. Oh, this is also a short one. The Napoleon of Notting Hill. This is absolutely brilliant as well. Um, it's in a, the idea was that at the time Chesterton wrote this, many um, dystopias about the future, like 1984, um, were coming out. And these all imagined a future that was like completely different, like transformed by technology. Everything's got a new name, things like this, where Chesterton's nightmare is kind of everything won't change very much. Having, having said that, what this book does is it has the, the setup is that um, people are just chosen by lottery to become king. So at the start of the novel, there's like three friends from an office walking along and the most like um, nerdy one or the least successful of the three um, suddenly gets tapped. To become the king of England and he takes over and his big idea is to reintroduce kind of the factional elements into the city of London and declare them all kind of like these almost like autonomous republics so he balkanizes London as a joke and because he enjoys like heraldic um, investigations and things like this and so he bestows suddenly all these um what would we call them, like empty titles that people have, like these older men or these mayors even of little boroughs of London are all reinvested with all their authority that, that's leaked away. Or maybe it was never even there. Maybe these jobs were largely kind of ceremonial. And it centers at the start on this issue of um, there's this strategically important street in London called, uh, with a pump and um, two boroughs want to want to buy this land and create a thoroughfare that traverses the um, um, whole of London, uh, inner London. And the, um, the Napoleon of Notting Hill, the mayor of Notting Hill, refuses and sets up um, this resistance. And he develops, like, he finds a guy in a chemist, or he finds a guy in a, a tobacconist, and they, they become part of his team, and he sets up a kind of military strategy um, to resist. And he actually raises an army and, re and repels um, an attempt to, <laughs> attempt to take this street. And um, these forces that he repels, they can't believe, like, the kind of... It's a inc really interesting, like, strategy. It's like blasting all the lampposts and, and fighting in the dark, this kind of guerrilla warfare. They return for more. And he's outthought them and he threatens them with a kind of biblical inundation. I won't tell you how he does that. But the point about the Napoleon is that he doesn't grasp any of the uh, of the humour of what the king was, was attempting to do. He takes it perfectly, literally. And actually, um, it's not a mask for him. It's, it's who he is. And he's a complete non-entity who is risen to this um, position of dominance. It's re really an amazing book. The thing about Chesterton's books is there's no one like Chesterton, really. There's a thing called the Chesterton sentence that no one else could write. Um, and ideas that no one else comes up with. He didn't write, he only wrote these two novels, but of course the Father Brown stories, I won't bore you with them. Um, but it's just an amazing writer. This is the best of Chesterton. Uh, I've got two more. This one is uh, really good. I have to put it here because maybe not so many people know this one. Max Beerbohm, um, Zuleika Dobson. It's got a cult following. It's uh, similar to the books like The Quest for Corvo, maybe in the same bracket. This is about 
um, a woman who comes to Oxford and she's irresistible and that's it men cannot resist this woman like the entire male population of the city all fall in love with her and the person who falls in love with her the hardest is this uh, kind of aristocratic dandy figure and I have to say I do like um, dandyism although you look at me on a particularly uh, dandyish or in my appearance but um, there we are I've got a lot of da books on, on dandyism here and this is a supreme statement of dandyism the language in here is just it's just amazing and this uh, aristocrat there's so many funny dimensions to it he belongs to this like Oxford society that he's the head of but there's not many people who are members have these amazing dinners where all these ghosts of past members appear and um, the muse Cleo the spirit of history is kind of part of this novel too and there's this also this weird magic trick going on inside this with some pearls that keep transforming their appearance um, as part of a way of symbolizing the, uh, the, the, uh, the love affair between the, uh, the dandy and um, Zulika Dobson and it climaxes with this amazing boat race where it's uh, this this one is difficult to summarize without oh, I can't really spoil it but it's the the dandyism I, I don't want to open the crack these books open and read them to you you won't believe how arch this is if you like Oscar Wilde and stuff like writers like this it's just it's such and it's so consistent all the way through to carry off this style for like 200 pages I mean there's Ronald Furbank novels that are hanging around over there somewhere I mean they're, the, they're dandyism too, but I don't think they manage to sustain the kind of the narrative interest. There's a really good, like, um, down at heel um, student in here. It's really well represented as well. Like, you know, you've got the dandy with his amazing mantle and his beautiful clothes. And then you've also got this kind of um, doubling of him with this this student who can't entertain any hopes of love because he's he's so down at heel. And they're living in close proximity, and the way their lives sort of touch upon one another lends something kind of deep to this story as well. It's a really, it's like a considered a curiosity, perhaps, but it's a very interesting and a good novel. I'm gonna choose one more. <sighs> this is the the last one, I promise. This is also um, very. Um, readable it's a bit longer than two it's just longer than 200 pages just about Evelyn War or Evelyn War Evelyn War I call it because that's how I say it and it's the ordeal of Gilbert Pinfold and there's all these different editions but I really like this one with these this this kind of lettering there it's kind of very it's almost kind of 30-ish, doesn't it? And these, I'm not so sure about the illustration, like Tintin or something on the front of there, but I've got these editions of it. The Ordeal of Gilbert Pinfold is War's account of his mental breakdown after his wife is also called Evelyn. They were the two Evelyns, or two Evelyns. It's up to you. It's up to you what you want to say. Um, it's about his breakdown, and he goes on a cruise but it's nothing like nothing like Captain's Courageous. Okay, it's not like that. Not like that cruise. Um, goes on a holiday to get away from it all, and on the holiday he has the most profound nervous breakdown. And the thing is, it's impossibly funny. I mean, Evelyn War is quite a funny writer anyway, but he's usually dealing with you know, society, you know, like the beautiful young young things in in. Um, in Vile Bodies, <clears throat> and actually I've read quite a lot of Evelyn War, and um, I, do, I do consider him actually one of the few of these like 20th century writers who is, he is a genius, when you consider how young he is when he's writing some of these novels, and the range of them as well, and the, and the craftsmanship of the writing. Black Mischief is also very short, and it's also oh, the the opening chapter of Black Mischief with all the double crossing of this incident on this um, in, in this um, sort of African nation, this ludicrous African nation. 
it's just superb. It's most famous for the the uh, the joke about the uh, the cannibalism. <laughs> no, I'm not going to spoil it by saying that because that's the first thing most people know about that. But this one, it's not turned outwards on society. It's kind of turned inwards, and the exploration of of the um, of, of consciousness on here. It's like an Alice in Wonderland kind of affair. And the paranoia that grips him on this ship is just the source of so much comedy. He's convinced that all these messages he gets tuned into, like these sort of Russian messages, I think some like Russian guy on the ship, and he's con con oh, it's very topical right now. The gurgling of the pipes he's interpreting as people talking about him. If you remember that movie Delicatessen where they all live in the same house, and there's the thing with the guy going crazy thinking he's hearing voices through the through the walls. Actually, later in that book, you learn that they're real. It's two old ladies trying to drive him crazy by breathing these nonsense messages and persecuting voices through the through the pipework. But it's the paranoia here. It's, and when he he gets absorbed into this uh, into this conspiracy, that's nothing but a product of his own imagination. It begins to flavor all his interactions and perceptions of the of the other people in the novels. So, there's nothing really to spoil in this other than to say it's it is it's incredibly funny there's probably parts of it that are considered like not so pc these days and like a, a kind of mild like it's not necessarily racism but people are typified you know by their their race it's like their race kind of um determines like more of uh, more of their personality than we'd really think was true these days um, that does come across it. I think there might be some anti-Semitism there as well, because the the paranoia and the conspiracy becomes like this kind of, you know, like tied up with like you're always classic like conspiracy mongers, you know, the um, the Jews there. But I think you can look over that because it's not a, a critique of society. It's actually just this bizarre account of what happened to him. And I think actually turning your nervous breakdown into this comic kind of. Um, it's a minor comic masterpiece here. It's, it's really, really good. I'm going to put one more on here before we go. <coughs> <coughs> the last one, while my cough intensifies, is less than 200 pages as well. I'll choose it because War said it was his his um, favourite, uh, one of his favourite comic books. And it is an absolute comic masterpiece that the title's well known, Diary of a... Nobody. The title's well known, but I'm not so sure how much people are reading it these days. Maybe just people like me. I always feel a bit disappointed when people say, oh, well, they're reading it at university, but no one... You know, like, because I do go to the university, but that's not why you have to read these books. You don't have to go to university to read these. And they're only Penguin ones. Anyone can buy them and read them if they want. You take your own path. But, of course, I was always interested in in getting hold of this one because I do like a lot of this comic writing in English and to say that this doesn't disappoint I mean the pictures are really funny as well these these uh, pictures this one with the bathtub is so amusing so amusing he, he pe tries to save money by painting his bathtub with this particularly cheap paint because it's become a like a fashionable thing to have this kind of red bathtub but he uses the wrong kind of paint and then he gets into it to have a bath he puts the water too hot and all the paint comes off the sides of the bath and dyes him <laughs> red so so he just you know you know in a moment there where he thinks he's he thinks he's bleeding to death and in, in his hot bath it's just really funny and there's also like the social like climbing part of it is done on such a small level that it's like it's like am i higher up in the social hierarchy than a butcher and things like this and so he works really hard to get invited to this party and then the triumph of being invited is undercut by all these people like a like a greengrocer that he knows being like being there as well it's like, oh great you know so it's really exclusive <laughs> they actually invited invited everyone no matter what like the postman's there as well that part of it is really funny and the way that it's just like the suburbs and they're trying to soak up like the sophistication from elsewhere but never doing it quite right it's just the source of all this all this gentle humor and his son the wastrel son with all his schemes to get rich is so 
funny. Again, he's kind of, um, uh, he's kind of like the terminal point for like a dandy, and he's mixed up with this theatrical troupe. It's just like nonsense, and they blow through the through life like a hurricane when these guys come along with all the bad behavior. And and also there's some very amusing parts where sudden what's worse than the son spending all the dad's money is suddenly sometimes the son just hits on loads of money and his dad sat there like oh I made three pounds this month and the, his son's bursting in like drunk with a, oh Peter I just made a hundred pounds you know it's like in ten minutes like, it's so so funny the way they're proud of him but he's he's kind of belittling them all all the time and his scrapes are really amusing he lends he lends it a lot of color but the sun is really really funny all right i'm going to stop this is video number two look i apologize for like you know last time i did this uh, last note will be on the the comments because last time i did it i just had like my heart had stopped and i was in hospital and people came on here and said oh you look so ill it's like yeah my heart stopped the day before i made the video but i, just, I was doing that video because i wanted to go and do a master's i didn't know if i was going to even live long enough to start the damn thing you know and get my application get my get posthumously accepted onto a graduate program it's you know it was like that and this time you know i'm here here in my my house i've been sick for days you know i've got i have not shaved this thing off and my hair's out of control i got yeah i've got the thing here because i'm almost 50 or maybe i just don't never do any exercise but please on the comments it'd be great if people said something about what i said rather than um, all these negative comments about what I look like because I'm not a model or anything like this. It's just if you want to hear what I've got to say. So yeah, I thought I could wait until I'm healthy to do these videos or wait until I look a bit better, you know. It's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> the day's not coming. I'll face the facts. You know, I'm getting older every day, Jason. So yeah, that would be my last little thing. And, and I'm sorry about the, the extremely low production value. I mean, this not going to win any prizes is it it's going to trouble the uh, oscar jury this year you know with 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 what's going on you know it's just in my rented house with all my stuff here so forget about all that i can get a better camera later if i spend a bit of money or be, anyone wants to watch my videos but for now just remember i'll just say them again the books i talked about diary of a nobody by these two brothers george and weed and gross great names evelyn war um, the Ordeal of Gilbert Pinfold, magnificent comic novel, Zulika Dobson, dandyism to the nth degree, it's, um, but it's managed, it's controlled, you know, that's the thing, I can't believe how well crafted this is, Napoleon of Notting Hill, balkanization of London, um, it's, you know, it's like kind of, it's just so imaginative, it's just so inventive, it's, it's just pure imagination. The Man Who Was Thursday, one of the most exciting um, adventure stories that you could read. Uh, it's, it's again, it's just Chesterton. It's just, it's, it's genius. The Island of Dr. Moreau. It's just, it's beautifully imagined, actually. I, I love, I didn't talk about it this time, but I love the tropics and the just the island colour of this and, and the, the, some of the humanity, the, the, there's more humanity in the dog, the man dog character than there is in Dr. Moreau. You know, something beautiful about the dog man is just the tragic figure in here. You know, it's, it's moving. If you lo if you love an if you really love animals and you know you decry what what we do to animals then this is a great book. Prato Violet or Prato Violet I think Prato really is German, isn't it? Um Christopher Ishwood, just an amazing study of a of a full, fully Developed human being, Friedrich Bergman, the film director. Last one is probably the most juvenile in some ways, but uh, I will do a Kipling video. If anyone really likes any of my videos like this one, then I will do a Kipling video because I know it's completely out of fashion. Don't worry about that. <laughs> no one knows that more than me uh, from being like doing my doing my studies and all the rest of it. Oh, but Richard Kipling is the is. From, in my estimation, is the most talented storyteller of the 20th century. You know, this guy won a Nobel Prize before his 40th birthday, and the layers 
there's always these, at least three layers. He said that himself about his writing. That it's always happening on three different layers. You can follow it. It's, it's just incredibly well realized his writing and and also the scope of his writing is unrivaled um to produce so much work in so many different kinds of on um, themes with so much um yeah so much variation like his stories about india he wrote my favorite book about england which is Pook, pook's hill a children's book and he only he only came to england when he was like what in his 30s or something he learned more about england in in a couple of years than people learn living there their whole lives it's extraordinary those are all my recommendations this was uh, jason kennedy uh tuning out nanu nanu until the next time